Welcome to Legislative Watch. I'm your host, Elizabeth Allen Hodge. Today's program is once again being recorded from the Capitol Annex, where the 60th Idaho State Legislature is in its first regular session. Our videographer is Chalice McAfee, who is filming and posting this to our website where you can watch this and previously recorded programs as well as keep up to date on the disposition of bills and other legislation. You'll find us at www.idaholibertywatch.com. That's idaholibertywatch.com. We have several guest legislators today, including a couple who are returning to us for with updates on legislation previously discussed on our program. Representative Lenore Barrett from District 35 is in her ninth term in the House. She chairs the Local Government Committee and sits on resources and conservation as well as revenue and taxation. Representative Dick Harwood is in his fifth term in the Idaho House and represents the northern part of the state in District 2. He's vice chair of Environment, Energy, and Technology. He also sits on resources and conservation as well as revenue and taxation. And representing the good folks from District 9 in the southwest portion of our state is Senator Monty Pierce, who is currently in his fourth term in the Senate. Monty is Vice Chair of State Affairs and sits on resources and environment as well as education. Welcome, everybody. I'd like to start with you, Lenore and uh, Dick, uh, relative to the Tenth Amendment. I understand, Dick, that you are actually going to be the sponsor, uh, Lenore and and have the legislature, I guess, are going to act as co-sponsors. Um, it's nice to know that this has got so much support. Um, so I'm going to ask you and Lenore, whichever one wants to, to give us an update as to where this joint memorial is and if we have a number or if it's an RS form. Thank you, Liz. Um, Dick is going to be the sponsor, and he's going to have a ton of co-sponsors. So let's turn the mic over to him, and he can bring us up to date. Elizabeth, I took it uh, today to the State Affairs Committee, and it's an RS form. It's 18733, and uh, it'll probably have a hearing in the State Affairs next uh, next week, early next week, I'm guessing. And uh, I run it by the speaker this morning, and he told me that's where to take it, so that's what I did. Good. Now, uh, as a recap for those who... Uh, heard Lenore and I guess we had Representative Hagedorn, Hart, and Boyle on as well who are co-sponsoring this legislation. Uh, this is relative to the Tenth Amendment. We, we often refer to that as state sovereignty or states' rights bill. So tell us a little bit about what your joint memorial will do, Dick. Well, basically it's to, to tell the federal government to back up a little bit on uh, some of the things they've been doing with us. Um, one good issue would be like the wolf issue. Uh, they run right over the state of Idaho and the sovereign rights of um, not to have the wolves in the state. We have asked, we ask many times not to have them here, and they got put here anyway. Um, another good is illustration was we just did a bill yesterday on uh, insurance for the state employees, and it was done by, uh, it was a kind of forced upon us by the federal government and um, the their, what do they call it, a, Zogby, is that what it's called? That it really is. Um, their accounting firm for the government says we have to do this, and if we don't, they're going to withhold $35 million from us. So them kind of things, um, they, they take away your rights to, to, to govern yourself as a state by either um, withholding money from you or, or just running over top of you with their uh, enforcement. And so what this does is just says... Um, you need to cease and assist from doing that, and um, give our and our states uh, have that sovereignty right under the Tenth Amendment, uh, which you know the power that wasn't delegated to the United States Supreme to the United States by the Constitution um, belongs to the state to the people of the state and Dick, the residents of the state. Maybe so. we should start. Uh, I, I'm sure that most listeners know what the Tenth Amendment, that the Tenth Amendment says that, you know, um, anything not, uh, all political power is inherent in the people. Government is instituted for their equal protection and benefit. And they have the right to alter, reform, or abolish the same whenever they may deem it necessary. And no special privileges or immunities shall ever be granted that may not be altered, revoked, or repealed by the legislature. Um, so 
this is the first part of your joint memorial. Let's go on. To, would you uh, take a moment to read the now therefore be it resolved sections because I think uh, it's helpful for people to know exactly what you're telling people here. Well, uh, let me let, let let me let Lenore do that because she's, okay. she's she has a darker copy, Gee, doesn't she? Thanks, <laughs> thanks Dick. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I was sitting here taking a little nap. Well, the now for, therefore be it resolved uh, by the members of the first regular session of the 60th Idaho Legislature, the House of Representatives, and the Senate concurring therein that the state of Idaho hereby claims sovereignty under the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States over all powers not otherwise enumerated and granted to the federal government by the Constitution of the United States be it further resolved that this serves as notice and demand to the federal government as our agent to cease and desist effective immediately mandates that are beyond the scope of those constitutionally delegated powers be it further resolved and this is the good one <laughs> that all compulsory federal legislation that directs states to comply under threat of civil or criminal penalties or sanctions or require states to pass legislation or lose federal funding be prohibited. And then, of course, you have a further result that where you send all this stuff. And there was another good, good one in here that I think the people would appreciate. Where's the one about the money, Dick? Uh, oh, uh, whereas uh, it's, Congress... It's, yeah, line 29. Whereas mm -hmm. Congress has inappropriately delegated its monetary authority to the private Federal Reserve Bank thus failing to protect and provide a sound monetary system as defined and mandated by the Constitution of the United States, forcing an unstable currency on us, resulting in the past and the current economic perils. You know, um, I don't know. I, I understand that maybe uh, Representative Nielsen has something relative to the Federal Reserve, and, and I think there's a lot of concern. Uh, regarding our monetary system, so I, uh, that is a, a crucial part of what you're uh, trying to do here. Now, one of the questions that I had is, uh, we've talked about the fact that the uh, feds overstep their boundaries at times. What happens when uh, the feds say, if you want money from us, you'll play our game? Um, ha with the economy being what it is, um, and nobody wanting their taxes raised, and you legislators hopefully not wanting to raise taxes, how is that going to affect us in terms of some of the programs that we have that may have some federal strings attached? Or will they continue to, to hold back? Hmm. That took so long, Elizabeth. I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, I'm saying that uh, the, the feds tie strings to certain right. bills saying if you want these, if you want funds, then matching funds, then you have to play our game. So if we say no to some of this, to the, to the feds <coughs> overstepping their bounds, are they going to withhold some of that money? Well, they probably would. They announced to you that if you don't do it our way, we won't play. And I think in the past it's been pretty... Um, I can't remember the specific issue. Uh, if we didn't do thus and so, they would withhold uh, our tax dollars for highways. Well, I'm going to be talking to the um, speaker about the stimulus package, oh, and I'm yeah. just wondering how much of that is going to be affected and whether this memorial would uh, hopefully up enough states. And I understand there's something like 20 states that have um, made reference to uh, the Tenth Amendment. Ah, yes, but there, and, well, yeah, that's as far as the Tenth Amendment uh, memorial resolution or whatever. But on that subsidy deal, I'm very disappointed in our conservative Republican Party, or at least the conservative end, because what you, we're hearing now, well, well, we don't mind taking something if it doesn't have any strings. Nothing comes from the federal government that doesn't have a string. And, yeah, okay, let's let Monty pitch in here. You know, I, I think that um, we're reminded of what happened a couple of years ago when Utah decided they had had enough of the Nickleby, No Child Left Behind, piece of legislation, and they um, simply sent word back with a resolution that we're, 
we're opting out of No Child Left Behind, and very shortly, plane load within a few weeks of, of, of uh, bureaucrats from D.C. came flying into Salt Lake, and transportation, law enforcement, uh, higher ed, uh, all of them said, transportation, you opt out now, of N Nickleby, you lose all these dollars. So they played hardball, and of course Utah backed down immediately, rolled over, and and uh, got involved back in Nickleby. You know, no child left behind. So I'm sure this same threat bears sway unless enough states, and they feel the tide swing against them. You know, which happened a couple of years ago. Well, this last year when we carried that. Uh, am I taking too much time? No, you're, you're just fine, but we do have to stop for a break, and when we come back, we'd like to further this uh, discussion relative to uh, the Tenth Amendment. I'm Elizabeth Allen Hodge. The program is Legislative Watch. Welcome back to Legislative Watch. I'm Elizabeth Allen Hodge, and today I have Representative Dick Harwood, Representative Lenore Barrett, and Senator Monty Pierce. We are talking about a joint memorial that uh, is now in an RS or routing slip form that will be uh, introduced to State Affairs sometime the first week of March. You're anticipating, is that right, Dick? Yeah, this next week. And for those who are curious, it is RS 18733. Um, at that point, when it comes before the State Affairs Committee, um, hopefully they will pass it, uh, excuse me, print vote it. to print it, and then at that point it will be circulated throughout the state. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Number. Now. It, it should go directly to Florida, shouldn't it? Ours do. No, ours don't. A joint memorial, uh, my understanding is we print it and then have a hearing, hearing. and then it passes yeah, to the House floor. The okay, so, um, Monty, prior to the break, we were talking about what happens when the state goes beyond its rightful bounds and um, starts kind of being heavy-handed with, um, excuse me, I said the states, I meant the federal government, when they start getting pretty heavy-handed with the states, with... Um, withholding money if you don't play their game. And of course, it seems like this Tenth Amendment lends itself to saying, you know, back off and follow the Constitution. And that's all you're asking to do is to follow the Tenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. But you were giving an example of what happened in Utah. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I, I did talk about Utah, but what I might tell you about is what happened two years ago this session we carried again a joint memorial that simply said that we no longer want to be involved in the, or have the United States involved in the North American Union or the Security and Prosperity Partnership or be have the North American Highway come through Texas from Mexico and clear to Canada. Um, out of that process, we passed that here, and 18 other states also picked it up various stages and passed various uh, versions of it. Oklahoma actually went to their border and said that highway will not cross from Texas into Oklahoma, and they just passed a, a, a law that said that it will not happen. And so there was a great amount of outcry against it. And then a year and a two months later, I received a letter from a person who said, thought you might be interested in this. And in the, council, in the current affairs magazine, which is the Council on Foreign Relations annual, you know, monthly or quarterly magazine, Robert Pasteur, who was the architect of the Security and Prosperity Partnership, wrote, as well as the North American Union, he said, because of the grassroots outcry, against this, we are going to have to do an end run is virtually what he said uh, around this, figure some other way around because this has effectively been killed by the grassroots effort. And I guess that gives me hope in that if enough states will pick up this Tenth Amendment idea and push it with anger, I mean, and say we have some passion feeling that, uh, that maybe the federal government will listen and say we're a little out of bounds and we better step back and give them some room. So I think that is a, a hopeful thing of it. And if too many of us stand up, it's pretty hard to discriminate against all of us. Dick, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Just that I thought it would be nice to have uh, more states jump in on this, and I think they will as, as time goes on. But one of the things that I that come to my mind as we were sitting here talking earlier, uh, one of our founding fathers said that um, when the people fear the government, you have tyranny, but when the government fear the people, you have liberty. And I think one of our problems is we keep losing our liberties <laughs> because we the people fear what the government is trying to do to us uh, and what they do monetarily if, if we don't do what they ask them to do they're going to 
they withhold money uh, as quick you know they just they'll threaten you with that kind of stuff and uh, you know maybe it's time for the states to to be on their own I mean kind of back away and say well okay take your money yeah and, and one of the things I think that part of the problem with that dick is not only um, well, the people have kind of gotten comfortable with voting themselves largesse from the public trust as well, and and our founding fathers warned us about that as well. So I think what it boils down to with this and with the stimulus bill and with anything else that has uh, strings attached, do the people have the um, perseverance and the intestinal fortitude to say no thank you to the federal government? That's going to be tough. It is going to be tough, and I'll play the devil's advocate for just a few seconds here, going back to what Monty was telling us about, because that was a different administration and a different Congress. I would really be concerned if what we have in place now at the federal level gives two hoots and a holler about what happens here. Can I respond to that? Yes. I only remind you, though, of what happened in 1992, Bill Clinton went in. The same exact wild verge of socialism started, and in uh, two years' time, we elected a new Congress. And these folks in D.C. are now aware of that, and they will become more aware as more states speak up and, and oppose. And so I think from the other side, I think we're very safe in, you know, again, advocating against what you're saying there because I think that um, they, they'll get that message that they don't want to get replaced. They want to carry that agenda for four years and not just two. Well, and I agree, and that gives me a little bit of comfort level. And then I always go back to uh, Winston Churchill, who said, never, 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 never give up. I, I, and we can't, but I think uh, the discouraging thing is when we hear every day how um, Congress plans to spend us out of this <laughs> recession. You know, I don't know about... I don't know how they figure that out. You know, in our budget, if, if um, we're tight, and of course everybody is right now, uh, it doesn't make sense to cash more checks and spend more money, and I don't see how that get, digs us out of a hole. So, Did anybody listen to the president's speech last night? I'm just going to throw this in because I have two new little babies in my family, and there was a... I don't, I can't quote this verbatim, but basically it was uh, all of this spending, but we're not going to burden our children and our grandchildren with debt that they cannot pay. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. Just think about that for a minute. Why burden them with any debt? You know, I've been using the story. Um, back in the 50s and 60s, there was a, a show on weekly called George Burns and Gracie Allen, mm -hmm. and uh, my folks just love that program. And there's a story where Gracie goes into an appliance store and everything's on sale, and she's just thrilled. And um, she said, you know, I'll take this, I'll take that. And of course, the salesman was loving it. She said, how much is that off? Oh, that's 50% off. That's wonderful. And how much this? And while he's writing all this up, at one point, Gracie turns and looks at the salesman and says, now, when I bought enough to pay for all of this, let me know. And it's, and it's the same, it's the exact same attitude, you know, when we've, we can save if we spend the money on this and we can save on that, and if we spend enough, we'll pay for it all. We don't have the Federal Reserve or the printing press. We don't have the Federal Reserve or the printing press to back us up on that, though. That's the problem. The, the problem is they do. <laughs> The stimulus package. My son sent me an email the other day about stimulus package. He said this professor took this college kid was wanting to know what the stimulus package was. So he said he took him over to his house and gave him a bucket. And he said, "No, we're going to take water out of this deep end. We're going to go down the port in the shallow end and just keep doing it until we make the shallow end deeper." And <laughs> that's kind of what he says. The kid said, "Well, that's futile." And he said, "Well, that's what the stimulus package is." And this good, Alan, good point of what the stimulus package is trying to do so well I think I think you folks have your um, work cut out for you in a number of ways that I think this um, resolution or this joint memorial is a first step in telling the feds that um, the states want to um, not be dependent on them and they don't want the feds to overstep their boundaries I think I especially like the part 
about the monetary system and the fact that we have an unstable currency as it is. Um, in the Newsweek, uh, about a week, a week and a half ago, there was a headline that said, we are all socialists now. And they were touting the, the, how wonderful it was that we are becoming more like Europe. And when you look at what's happened in Europe, um, I don't know how anybody can rejoice over that, but I, I think that part of this joint memorial, along with the fact that it's upholding the, the uh, Constitution, I just hope that, uh, I know it'll pass in Idaho, I'd be shocked if it didn't, but I just hope other states will uh, be as forceful. And we all hope that other states will join because I got to tell you, and maybe I'm too much of a redneck, but uh, if you're going to say no to the federal government, then be prepared to not take the money. I don't think that's necessarily redneck. I, I mean, it could be redneck, but I'm just saying <laughs> that that just makes a lot of sense. Well, it does to me, and I think that's what the Founding Fathers had in mind. And what was Shakespeare that said, neither a borrower nor a lender be? That's well, good that, advice. You can even find that in the scripture if you look hard enough. I think he also said kill all the attorneys, but we, we <laughs> won't go there. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. You had some other legislation that you wanted to talk to relative to wolves, Lenore. Okay. We can, we can do wolves. This is a, a House Joint Memorial number one that was passed in committee today to the floor with the due pass recommendation. And here again, we get into the, the hanky and the wind type thing. But the one thing that has been, this is, was prompted because we were up twice for delisting. Okay, when, when we get back from the break, let's have you explain a little bit more about that, and then we'll talk about the Second Amendment as well that you have coming up. I'm Elizabeth Allen Hodge. The program is Legislative Watch. Welcome back to Legislative Watch. I'm Elizabeth Allen Hodge, and with me today at the Capitol Annex is Representative Lenore Barrett and Representative Dick Harwood. We were talking prior to the break about a wolf memorial that, you're, uh, that you've introduced, Lenore, and I, you were explaining how that worked. Okay, Elizabeth, uh, well, it works about like any other house joint memorial. Um, this came about because the second time we were up for delisting, then the administration changed, but there was, as far as I'm concerned, a little hanky-panky. If they had stayed with the, uh, the dates and the process and getting it in the Federal Register and the 30 days after that and all that, we probably wouldn't have been nailed by the incoming administration, which has the right to put a hold on, uh, uh, no, it's in here somewhere. Ex explain oh, for our one. listeners, um, yeah. Lenore, what delisting means taking the wolves off the Endangered Species Act, which has given them protection now for almost 14 years. Uh, you can't shoot them, you know, you, you can't protect, well, there may be some circumstances if you go to the right people and get the right permit and do the right thing, but it's the Endangered Species Act. The wolves were brought in in I think it was 1994. I never get that well, clear. They, they, brought, they brought them in when I was in the legislature, right. and I was in until 1990, so it was in the and 80s technically, or 90s. And technically, the uh, feds didn't do anything illegal because Jerry Connolly, then the director mm -hmm. of the Fish and Game, uh, gave them a permit to do it. I had this marked up, but these aren't the ones I had marked up, I guess. But anyway, it was because of that, that that we thought we were about to delist. And the original House Joint Memorial 5, which was done along the, during that time period, um, said uh, we wanted the wolves delisted immediately and removed by whatever means necessary. And that kept its place, although it was a memorial, it kept its place in legislation and was part of the... Uh, the wolf management plan that we finally got the feds to agree to. I mean, I could go on forever with background, but let's let's forget that. We got to the D list. It was held is being held indefinitely. Did you find my thing? Yeah, it's being held indefinitely. 
uh, from publication in the Federal Register, and that's part of the process. It has to be published in there before we can proceed on to delist. Okay. And that's the indefinite part. Uh, so what we're asking in this memorial, because we did everything the way we were supposed to. I did not support the wolf management plan. I didn't want them in here at all. It happened. We're stuck because we made an agreement with the feds on the plan. But we have done everything that was required of us to meet their specs. And when it comes right down to it, as far as I'm concerned, they, they have betrayed us. They won't get that delisting taken care of. So is this basically what the memorial is? Well, saying? the memorial is basically, uh, I know we have, uh, you know, our Attorney General's office and our Office of Species Conservation and the governor, they're all working very, very hard to get us back into that delist process and to get that done because the fish and game were ready. We were ready when we left last year, left session last year to delist. Fish and Game had made their plans and everybody was okay. We're, we're there almost. Then it didn't happen. So we're all standing around looking at our toes. But um, <clears throat> this is just to urge, I love that word, urge. I like demand, but we didn't use demand. Anyway, urge the, the President and the Secretary of Interior to to uh, with get rid of that withholding that they've got there, and they have a right to do that, but we've been working on it for 14 years. We did everything. If they have any confidence in their agencies at all, all they have to do is look and see that we're there and we need to have our delist. But uh, now, do we, we don't have Dirk in there anymore, do we? As no. Uh, <laughs> Gosh, too bad we couldn't have done this when, when Dirk was in there. I think we would have stood a better chance. Well, now, wait a minute. I, let, me, let me be careful there. I can't remember when the first D-list came down. Do you remember? We had one D-list that, of course, then the environmental groups went to court and fouled everything up. Mm -hmm. And the this, this second time around, actually, the judge uh, probably did okay and we were ready for the Federal Register, but it didn't happen because of the change of administration. So basically what you're doing with this joint <coughs> memorial is you're encouraging Congress Encouraging to co Congress and the President of the United States to get off the dime okay. and honor their agreement, as we have done. Now, Dick, I understand you have some legislation that kind of follows along these lines in terms of if a rancher or a farmer or I guess anybody is out there living out in the country and you've got problems with wolves that can attack your livestock, um, I guess it's it's against the law to shoot a wolf. And yet, um, how, how does that work? Are there certain exceptions to that? There is. We passed a law that you can protect your livestock, uh, your, okay. your animals, your dogs and you know, people. You, you can do that um, in Idaho safely. Okay. Uh, but the problem is, um, if you look at it as a monetarily, uh, uh, Senator Crapo done a study a few years ago and it showed how much an elk would be worth in the state of Idaho. What they did was took out all the people that paid for hunting license and everything in the interstate, out of state, and they added them all up. Then they seen how many elk they'd killed, and then they divided that into it. And each elk was was worth about $8,000. And the fishing game will even tell you now that uh, that one wolf will kill 19 to 20 elk a year. Mm -hmm. So if you figure that up, it's about $160,000 damage to the state of Idaho, which we're not getting any depredation from the federal government for that. But um, and also the fishing game will tell you that there's, they'll say this is a conservative number, but they say there's either 1,000, 1,200, somewhere in that area of wolves out there. And the thing was. This was these were supposed to delist at 100 wolves, 10 mating pair, and here we here we are 1,200 <laughs> wolves, you know. And the other thing about it is, if if you talk to the people that really go out and do the walking, hunting, and looking, uh, they'll tell you that there's more than that. There's probably 2,000, 2,500 mm. wolves in the state. And I think what this does is send them a signal saying, you guys need to back up again and. Uh, and you need to delist these things for us so we can 
so we can start managing them. And, and then you have <clears throat> some uh, uh, trailing legislation relative to um, uh, what uh, happens if... I do. I, I had a piece uh, uh, drafted and uh, and I'm not sure what I'm where that's going to go yet. But what it does say is that uh, uh, it will make it illegal for the Idaho Fishing Game, Idaho State Patrol, county sheriffs, any law enforcement to assist the U.S. Fish and Wildlife with the arrest of anybody who killed a wolf or the prosecution of anybody that killed a wolf. And in that, it has a penalty of a, it'll be a misdemeanor offense if you do do that. And you could be imprisoned in a, I think it's a $5,000 fine or something. Is, is that what the law reads now, that if someone is found guilty of killing a wolf, that they would be guilty of a misdemeanor and imprisoned? No, the Fish and Game, or the Fish and Wildlife Service has a, whatever it is, do you remember what it was, Lenore? I think it's $240,000 fine or something wow. like that. It's a huge, it's a, it's a, it's a real high fine. Um, but state passed them laws last couple of years ago that allows us to, if we're feeling threatened, if you're, if they're attacking your animals or whatever, then you have a right to kill it, and that that will then the fishing game or the fish and wildlife service can't oppose that because that's something the state has done. Well, I and can't imagine uh, why a person wouldn't be allowed to defend their property or their lives <laughs> from a wolf. So. Well, they haven't been until just recently. Right. Uh, the, we wrestled around with the 10J rule, and then we What's did... the 10J rule? Do you know exactly what the 10J rule is? It means when, it means when our wolves get overpopulated in one certain area, and you get what you have, what you call a um, predator pit, where the, the, the elks and the deer that are there aren't going to come back, then we have a right to go in and take them uh, wolves out of that area by killing them, trapping them, however. Okay. And uh, they're, they're, the fishing game is leaning towards that type of thing. They're wanting to, to do that in a couple areas. And I'm not sure the federal government is going to let them do it, but they, they, it's in our thing saying that they can. But, uh, but that, again, is what the federal government, the way they read things, you know. Well, it's interesting, you know, um, it seems to me that when uh, there's overpopulation in certain, um, uh, like deer and elk, you know, they issue more permits and stuff. And um, I don't understand why they're not issuing something in terms of, of being able to shoot some of these wolves, period. Well, you can do that, uh, but you have to go through all the hoops and the... I see. Uh, if a pack becomes too large in an area and there is predation on, on, um, on livestock, yeah. or if you have a predation on wildlife, okay. then, but you have to go get permission. Okay. When we come back, um, let's follow up on the discussion on this, and I believe there's also a memorial relative to the Second Amendment. I'm Elizabeth Allen Hodge. The program is Legislative Watch. Welcome back to Legislative Watch. I'm Elizabeth Allen Hodge, and today I have Representative Lenore Barrett and Representative Dick Harwood, who's been talking about a joint memorial to Congress relative to the Tenth Amendment. We've also talked about another memorial relative to wolves in Idaho, and you were going to make some more comments on that, Lenore. Okay, I'll, I'll just close the wolf section a little bit. But first let me say that all three of these uh, house joint memorials are very closely related. It's all about the violation of the federal government, the violation of the Constitution, mm -hmm. getting outside their proper role of government. Now, the wolf thing, uh, I'm happy to carry the memorial, and uh, I think it's a good little memorial. I think it will serve a purpose, but I will also tell you that there are growing numbers of grassroots citizens who are just fed up with the wolf issue. Mm -hmm. And they were very, very upset <clears throat> when we lost the delisting, and they want to go further and harder and do more, uh, something statutory to go into our code book that we would then have to defend as a state. The the numbers are there, and 
if you follow along at all, the environmental groups are now beginning to advertise a lot more about the wonderful role that wolves play in our lives. <laughs> and none of it's true, but then if you pay for the ad, you can say whatever you want to. So I think that there is enough unrest stirring out there that they sense this and that they're beginning to respond. And we are being told, or I am being told, I better be careful there, I am being told that uh, the anti-wolf group, and I, I hate to use the word anti, we're not against the, the wolf, we're against the way it was brought here, mm -hmm. and we're mad at the federal government for doing it. But anyway, uh, there will probably be a campaign war between the two sides over that because the people that are calling me and emailing me to death <laughs> outside of the beer tax people <laughs> <laughs> uh, are really dead set in getting something done. We hope that the memorial will take care of the situation, but if it won't, they will expect more to be done, and we'll deal with that. But, um, and one of the, the things that made it so hard on the, on the wolf issue is whenever you go to court uh, on the basis of the Tenth Amendment, which we are told by our Attorney General we won't get anywhere doing that, is because of the Commerce Clause. The federal government manipulates the Commerce Clause. They throw that in to uh, make their excuse for having the right to do what they do with the Endangered Explain Species Explain that Act. to our listeners, Lenore. Well, the Commerce Clause was uh, to give the federal government jurisdiction over states if states were having a little scrap over who sent what to whom and how much they were charging for it to come in. It's, mm -hmm. it's commerce. Mm -hmm. And right now, there is no wolf commerce that I'm aware of. Uh, in the past, there could have been some commerce uh, pelts. Mm -hmm. You know, you could sell pelts. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe you'll start up a, a wolf farm in Washington and you want to ship your wolves over there. Uh, there could be commerce, but right now there is no commerce. And there was no commerce at the time that they uh, dropped them into Idaho. So, But they stretch things to suit their needs. And uh, you just you go to court or you try to reason with them. And uh, anyway, I'm going to leave the wolves for now because there's plenty of people that are pretty darn mad about this. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they're going to be quiet forever. And you wanted to kind of go into the, uh, like the Second Amendment. And that's, gosh, every night you go to bed and you wake up and somebody else is after the Second Amendment rights. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> it, you know, it's always uh, amazed me is uh, both at the state level and at the federal level, um, Congress and state legislatures, you know, the first thing after you're elected to office, I remember holding my right hand up and taking an oath of office to do what? To uphold, uphold and the, defend const the Constitution. Absolutely. And so then, you know, at the state level, you're trying to uphold these uh, laws, and what happens? The feds come in and they pretty much ignore the Constitution. Well, and if you, you've got, you have to have the Second Amendment, Dick, because if you don't, you can't protect the other. Nine. That's true. <laughs> hey, uh, Elizabeth, I wanted to say one thing on this wolf thing that uh, this, the one that Lenore has been is doing here. Uh, there's on line 26. It talks about a whereas. Whereas the Supreme Court has ruled with New York versus United States 505 U.S. Uh, 144 in 1992 that Congress may not simply commandeer the legislators and legislative and um, regulator proceed. Process, Regulatory process, yeah, um, of the of the state. And yet we see that. I mean, mm -hmm. that's exactly what's happened. Mm -hmm. We have a regulate. We have it regulating. We say we we got a management plan and process. We have all this stuff happening here, and yet the the courts. I mean, the, yeah, the courts and the federal government are saying no. Uh, President Obama has, has uh, said we're not going to look look at that. We're not going to put that on the on the list. You know. And the courts have already made their ruling once before that we weren't going to delist. And, um, you know, we're, we're being run over by them again. So this would be another good illustration for the, for the Tenth Amendment, why you well, know, it's it all, almost, fits, all fits together. It's almost as if they're doing it just because they can. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, that's that's a pretty good way to say it. They're doing it because they can, and we don't challenge. And sometimes when we do, we lose, especially in the Supreme Court. If you lose in the Supreme Court, where do you go? So you have to be very careful when you go to the Supreme Court and be sure you ask the right questions because the justices are a little bit more astute maybe than we give them credit for. But anyway, if you don't challenge, then it's, you know, silence is consent. If right. you don't challenge. And we, we need to challenge any way that we can. And if we have to, we need to go to court and make that challenge again, although we've lost some challenges in court. But I really mean that about the Second Amendment. And I don't know how much time we have because Marv couldn't get out of the meeting that uh, he's currently in. Well, give us a, uh, at least a, a, an introduction to it, and we'll have Marv on, on another program. Okay, well, uh, whereas the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution does not simply provide for a collective right or a right for the state to establish militias, rather it provides for the right of the people to keep and bear arms. And I'm pretty sure that's been, that was the case from the Supreme Court that, that uh, substantiated that. Whereas the primary purpose of the right to keep and bear arms is to protect oneself, family, and possessions from either the private lawlessness of other persons or the tyranny of government, and whereas the right to keep and bear arms is also meant to protect the general private use of firearms and activities, such as hunting and other sporting activities, and whereas the United States Supreme Court in District of Columbia versus Heller, 128 SCT 2783-2008, recently struck down a firearms ban in the District of Columbia explicitly ruling that the Second Amendment protects the right of the people to possess firearms for private use and whereas despite this ruling legislation has been introduced in the United States House of Representatives calling for a system of mandatory federal licensing of all firearms owners and and I'm going to stop there because we were reassured during the campaign I mean the National Rifle Association were in opposition to uh, pre now President Obama. They did not support him at all because he was the uh, gun control president. He said, no, I'm not going to take your guns away from you, but there are other ways to take your guns. You don't have to go down the street with boots and swastikas just to take guns. So, uh, and, and there, that just tells you that this is already kind of underway. Mandatory federal licensing of all firearms owners and whereas the legislation introduced would require all firearm, firearm owners to apply for and carry a federally issued picture identification in order to keep any firearms in their homes and whereas the legislation introduced would make it a federal crime to keep a loaded firearm or an unloaded firearm and ammunition with any premises including under certain circumstances american homes where a child may be present and i'm just going to throw in there where some nut may come in off the street and take your child out through the window but anyway, whereas the legislation introduced specifically purports to preempt any state or local law inconsistent with it, there's your, there's your problem. It will preempt any state or lo local law inconsistent with it. So once again, sovereignty is, is violated, and that's a violation of the Constitution. Whereas the introduced legislation, Blair Holtz Firearm Licensing and Record of Sale Act of 2009, and I'm getting emails on that, is a direct imposition on each American individual's right to keep and bear arms in their homes and for their protection. Then you go into the therefore be it resolved. And that's, that's going to have to be the subject for a future program. Now, this really is something that we want to follow up on, so we will have Representative Hagedorn back. I want to thank Representative Lenore Barrett and uh, Representative Dick Harwood for uh, coming to us and giving us an update on the Joint Memorial. Until next week, I'm Elizabeth Allen Hodge. The program is Legislative Watch.